Welcome to RTV Chit Chat, Raising the Village's informal podcast. Raising the Village, or RTV, is a non-profit organization that partners with last mile communities in rural Uganda to end ultra-poverty in our generation. I'm your host, Sula Olaja, and I'm a part of RTV's small but mighty communications team. In this podcast, we will explore various topics about the work we do, have interesting conversations with our stakeholders, and share our experiences of working in partnership with last mile communities. Our guest today is Timothy Ahumuza, a senior officer in RTV's Planning, Evaluation and Learning, or PEEL team in Uganda. In this episode, Timo and I talk about RTV's newly concluded Ready to Eat initiative that prevented food loss and provided food security for over 1.2 million community members during the pandemic in last mile villages in Uganda. Welcome, Timo. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to get started by asking you about what your role entails at Raising the Village. Can you tell me a little bit about what areas you focus on as a senior appeal officer? Thank you, Sila. And uh, um, of course, as a appeal officer uh, with Raising the Village, PEEL we focus much more on the planning component and designing component mm -hmm. uh, with evaluation and learning and then the data management. Mm -hmm. So basically, my, my, my day's work is much more focused on how I, we would actually improve processes in terms of how we can scale out our programs by doing different surveys and evaluations like the science evaluations. So by the project outcomes, we can be able to tell how our process is actually improving, how they're performing, and uh, this calls for corrective action but also on the program and designing process, uh, part of the peer work, uh, we look at uh, completing the project designs and allocating different inputs and uh, seeing how better we can improve our communities uh, through the prioritized needs uh, from our community engagements. And like recently, uh, part of the planning phase of peer, uh, we came up with a ready to eat project because of the COVID that we had at the beginning of last year, and we managed to implement some sustainable solutions uh, to be able to support our partner communities to come out of such challenges. I'm glad you mentioned RTE because one of the reasons we're having this conversation today is to celebrate some of the achievements of this program and talk specifically about the issue of food security. Um, which I guess has become an extremely important issue, especially during the times of COVID-19. So my understanding is that uh, addressing food security in last mile villages is already a part of our core program. But I was wondering if you could give us a little bit more detail about how the Ready to Eat program started last year. Uh, was it an extension of our already ongoing programs or was it sort of like a newly developing thing? Thank you, Sila. Actually, with the Ready to Eat project, um, of course, at the beginning of last year, when we had the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, we, we partnership from the Department of Economics at Oxford. Uh, RTV has been conducting an RCT study in one of our partner communities, and the PIL team had been monitoring these communities for some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the beginning of COVID, um, at the beginning of the lockdown, actually, mm -hmm. uh, we realized that um, uh, these households were actually depleting most of their savings. Uh, they were they were withdrawing their savings maybe to sustain themselves for food. Then there was increased borrowing. Still, this can, came back to the need to provide food for the families. Mm -hmm. And uh, almost 50% of the households had reduced to one meal per day. And this was alarming. But that sparked the uh, the need for the ready to eat. So at that point, RTV, because of course, from our core thematics, we have agriculture. RTE is an extension of the agriculture program. And then we designed this ready to eat project uh, for our communities. 
I'm sort of just now realizing, Timo, that you and I both know what this program actually is because we work for uh, Raising the Village. But for the people who are listening to us maybe for the first time or who are not super um, familiar with some of our programming or specifically what we're really referring to when we say ready to eat, do you mind sort of summarizing uh, the whole thing from start to finish? Yeah, sure. So ready to eat uh, garden boxes. The initial design is that uh, at the community level, we group villages, uh, five to 10 maybe. We normally consider that to be a parish level or a cluster level uh, for the government structures of Uganda. So we implemented this project at a parish level and we set up one huge nursery bed with 12 varieties of vegetable seeds. Uh, we put these vegetable seeds to the nursery and do the care management centrally for all the cluster villages, all the parish villages, if I may say. And uh, at the household level, we conduct trainings on the basic agriculture practices and organics as a, as a, as a core component to pesticide, pests management. And um, so we prepare the communities to receive these seedlings uh, when they are ready. Mm -hmm. And um, we each household is expected to receive approximately 150 seedlings mm -hmm. and uh, this was supposed to be utilized uh, on their gardens looking at the five by five meter plot and also utilizing the different uh, options like old sacks, uh, broken plastic and the rest and the good thing with the ready to eat uh, these seedlings will be ready for harvest uh, three to four weeks after the distribution to the households so we managed to implement this to our partner communities in three districts, and uh, we registered so much success uh, implementing this very detailed project. Right, three to four weeks, that's, uh, that's such a fast turnaround time. I'm wondering if, so the decision of sort of like choosing which crops are suitable or uh, which ones are the least vulnerable, is this dependent on that three to four week uh, sort of window or does that have to do more with sort of some of the geographical or like climate factors where some of these last mile routes are located? Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, if you look at uh, most of the varieties that we uh, we considered for the RTE, mm -hmm. most of them are leafy in nature. Uh, most of the vegetables are leafy. And uh, of course, we consider the compatibility of the soils. Uh, I know like in some areas, like in the north, we had introducing some other varieties uh, basing on uh, the compatibility of the soils and also recommendations from our technical people uh, on how best some of these varieties can perform better within these communities. And to our surprise, actually, uh, because we had a buy-in uh, for all the varieties we planted uh, by all the community members uh, as to be compatible they were saying these crops, uh, these vegetables have been grown there previously and they can do well. So we didn't have most of challenges uh, regarding the varieties for which, which type of uh, soils or for which areas. And when I'm talking about the vegetables, uh, we had, uh, just to mention but a few, we had amaranth, we had skuma wiki, mm -hmm. uh, we had nakati, we had black nightshade, we had African spider plant, we had pumpkins, we had white egg plants purple eggplants. So all these, we expected that each household to receive approximately 150 vegetable seedlings. So when we talk about this food source being sustainable to the households, once um, community members sort of go through those trainings, receive all the basic information and grow their first crops, are they able to do this on their own without any additional support or without any like seeds or boxes being delivered for the rest of their time? Yes, uh, you know, of course, our TV is a one-time investment. That's what we've been practicing for some time. Mm -hmm. the, the, the extension workers and some of our uh, technical people uh, for the RTE train the communities on how best actually uh, communities can extract seed mm -hmm. out of those very seedlings that we gave them. Mm -hmm. You know, when uh, plants mature, uh, they have uh, their fruits and those fruits can, can be used to extract seeds out. And that is the case that we implemented for the RTE. 
And on top of that, um, we also had the flyers. Hmm. Uh, we gave out information guides uh, to communities and they detailed how you can actually set up a nursery bed uh, with, uh, for, for some vegetable uh, seeds, how you can do the care and management, how you can harvest, and eventually how you can uh, extract seed out of those uh, seedlings that we have distributed in the household. Great. So that was sustainable in nature. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so I have some stats here that are pretty impressive. In the first phase of the project, the ready-to-eat boxes reached more than 220,000 people. And in the second phase, you reached over 1 million in 10 weeks. This wasn't only rolled out in our existing districts of operation, as you mentioned, but across the whole country. So that's unbelievably impressive. I'm, I really want to ask you, what, what are some of the key factors in making sure that your team succeeded, especially in this uh, last year in, in the second phase? Yeah, thank you, Sila. Uh, uh, we are all still amazed by the numbers, uh, <laughs> what we managed to achieve in just a 10 weeks window. Um, it's, it's really pretty impressive. Yeah, for the first phase, we reached uh, approximately 220,000 people uh, from our phase one of the project. And um, this was the basis for our success in the phase two, if I may say, uh, because we learned from our mistakes from the phase one, right. like ability to track what was going on, uh, committing a dedicated team to the Ready to Eat project uh, across the different districts. So we, we really took our time. And of course, on top of that, uh, there was a strong commitment. We brought on technical people uh, with a good background in agriculture and uh, people who loved agriculture as a passion. So they would really want to see this um, uh, nursery bed succeed. They would want to see the outcome, the good production at the end of the day. So they dedicated most of their time. Each, each dedicated officer was supervising, overseeing around 13 nursery beds so it made it made them love their job it made them work hard also the guys used to wake up like at six to go and see how things are, are coming through in the community uh, and also we had um, a good partnership with the, with the government through the extension services they supported us uh, entirely well uh, even looking at the parish chiefs trying to coordinate most of our activities trying to mobilize for us the communities uh, in sourcing for local materials and also we have a technical team as RTV uh, in the field of agriculture. Mm -hmm. They were supportive entirely. They were in close communication with the RTE team, uh, giving them some of the uh, techniques they can utilize so that they can uh, succeed. But of course, um, we faced some challenges as, as we yeah. move along the way. If I may recall, you know, operating, you are still in COVID times, mm -hmm. it was really hard to coordinate uh, during this COVID period. Yeah. One had to be extra careful. Mm -hmm. uh, then also there are harsh communities. You go to a community and they are not buying in easily. So you have to go rounds and rounds of strong sensitizations, uh, which delays projects, uh, but eventually they come on board after understanding how good the project is. Then we had cultural differences, especially yeah. when we entered different regions. Um, we, we had our own challenges. We were hit by a prolonged drought mm -hmm. uh, as we implemented this project. So this delayed our project a bit because some nurseries had to be replanted. But at the end of the day, we succeeded. Yeah, I mean, congratulations once again. It's, it's Thank you. These, these stats are something to be proud of. Not only for mm -hmm. you, but, but for, for the whole team. I think you sort of touched upon it a bit, but can you talk a little bit more about the implementation approach the team takes, especially when you're interacting with the communities and when you're sort of going through all of these trainings and, and going back to villages to conduct some of the monitoring, like as, as a process, how does that work? Yeah, of course, uh, the RTV approach as usual uh, of engaging the local leadership and also the government structures. So like for most of mobilization, we relied mostly on the, on the local council ones. Uh, these people who head the villages. We through, of course, partnerships with the government and also the parish chiefs, we managed to get their contacts and we would try to work around 
uh, to ensure that we are moving with them uh, because they will mobilize for us uh, at the distribution times when we are giving out the seedlings uh, during trainings to mobilize their communities, look out for the model farmers to come and attend trainings mm -hmm. and also trying to help us complete the household registrations to understand uh, what capacity, uh, the number of beneficiaries we are going to reach out to so that our approach has always been community engagement and also partnering with the government. And then also, uh, as we implemented this Ready to Eat project, uh, we brought in an element of information guides. Right. Uh, these were talking about the different seed varieties. And the beauty about this is that they were actually translated in the local language. Mm -hmm. So we had around um, in four different languages mm -hmm. that suit the local, the local person. Uh, and we would advise them to group in, in tens so they can discuss whatever entails in that information guide and then right. they can practice as a group. Yeah. So it sort of encourages a dialogue between the community members as well, which I That's guess true. ends up like strengthening like their learning experience. Yeah, sure. yeah. That's great. So the major outcomes of this project were to address the rising food insecurity, um, you know, as previously mentioned, prevent income loss resulting from the pandemic, as well as protecting communities' productive assets. I know you will continue to monitor the impact uh, in your various evaluations over the course of the year, but um, can you tell me a little bit about what kind of impacts have you observed so far as a result of the project? Yeah, actually, I, I think this effect is two way, uh, one to the community and also as RITV. Uh, maybe to begin with RITV, uh, I think we managed to understand our ability to scale our program mm -hmm. in, just say, a very short time, uh, mm -hmm. looking at the 10 weeks, 10 weeks project that we just implemented and reaching out to uh, this much in terms of uh, the beneficiaries. I think it's really encouraging uh, for the organization uh, as we assess our capacity to scale our programs to even other areas. Mm -hmm. And also looking at the community side, we've had a lot of feedback from the government, from the community itself, especially with how this Ready to Get project has turned the lives of uh, different communities. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, we had so much buy-in by all of the partner communities through their district leadership mm -hmm. on scaling and implementing this project. Everyone was yearning to reach out to us. Actually, even by the time we implemented the project, more people were still calling that, come and be, come and support our communities mm -hmm. because they understood uh, the, the importance of, uh, of the vegetables, what it could actually support uh, at the household level, looking at the nutrition and also supporting a meal at the household. So we had so much positivity from the community. From our first phase, communities are enjoying the vegetables. We've been in touch with them through our different monitorings. And you can find at least each household has a vegetable garden of not less than seven varieties. Because at the end of the day, communities choose on what they really want to continue growing. Uh, of the total varieties we, we initiated with them, we have, always have our annual surveys. I hope as we conduct our annual survey, uh, this year in August, we shall be amazed by the fact that communities have something on their gardens, they have something at their households, and at the end of the day, they have something to consume. Yeah, that's, that's so inspiring. And, and maybe on that very comment again, yeah. uh, one last thing is that, um, uh, you know, for the, for the entire project, phase one and phase two of the Ready to Eat, mm -hmm. uh, the community con had a contribution and that was land set up. But I can tell you that out of uh, approximately 200 and 272 sites that we implemented for both phase one and phase two, the community entirely provided land, approximately one acre per, per parish for us to put up our nursery bed. So that was so much commitment uh, from the community itself on how good, on how best they really wanted this project. And I, I'm hoping it's really working out for them very well. Yeah. Um, I want to ask if you recall um, any moments or stories from the field during the project that were 
motivating for you? Any story that you can uh, tell us that you find inspiring? Yes, I have very many stories, very many stories. <laughs> you can imagine, Sarah. Yeah. Like uh, moving from different regions, uh, being approached by different people. Uh, but of course, some are so touching uh, that I could actually share. There is one gentleman in one of our partner districts called Rubanda. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I just got to know about this gentleman through some of the photos that the field teams were actually sharing mm -hmm. on our WhatsApp platform. So I was amazed by him. Uh, he had uh, he had set up the nursery beds very well. So I, I took time to come and uh, visit his, his, his gardens mm -hmm. and um, just to realize he is a, a gentleman who was very humble. He had actually given out almost three acres of land mm. uh, for the project, and he was supporting even other parishes that failed to find land. This is a gentleman who dedicated almost all his time to ensure that the seedlings come out well, they are being watered, they are not being hit by too much sunshine, the sheds are there. So I was amazed to find this gentleman dressed in a nice suit, mm -hmm. going to water our nurseries. So Timo, how did RTE prevent income loss specifically? And was it also a source of additional income for the partner families? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I, I think currently vegetables are marketable uh, uh -huh. because people are actually selling most of their household crops, talk of the beans, talk of the ground nuts to earn something for their family maybe for health and the rest. And right. then they, to the extent that they even sell out what they would have actually eaten. So now if people have vegetables, at least they would know that we have something to eat for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then we can earn something from the sale of other household crops. I think that is the, uh, the distinction between the two. But at the end of the day, uh, I think our communities have a lot of production from the vegetables look at the eggplants and they eventually take to markets. Uh, look at the skuma wiki, they eventually take to markets. Look at the black night shed, they're saying it's so nutritious, they eventually take to markets. Of course, at the end of having something for them uh, to eat at their households, so the surplus can be taken to, to yeah. the markets. Now that the project has ended, you are back to your regular duties as a, as a senior appeal officer, going back to leading the evaluation team and everything, but will you miss being on the road? <laughs> <laughs> I imagine that you would. Uh, well, I would. <laughs> but I to ask if that's the case for you. Well, um, it's true. Uh, I'll miss the road, but really not so much because it, it was really so tiring. Because it was time in, time out. Every time I'm uh, coming from the north, people from the west are saying, Timothy, you have been away for so much time. Please come yeah. and check on us and give us some guidance. As I'm going there, people from the east are saying, Timothy, now where are you? Uh, so it was a bit tiring. Um, I'm back to, 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 to my evaluation team now. <laughs> uh, they have really achieved a lot in my absence. Mm -hmm. And I'm really trying to catch up and ensure that we are moving at the same pace, trying to yeah. give them some direction. and. Uh, some guidance, but um, uh, we had some key takeaways as the evaluation team. When we were beginning this project, looking at how diverse it was, especially the, the component of tracking. Mm -hmm. So we, 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 we stood up and uh, the evaluation team spearheaded the tracking component and we developed a, a dashboard, an internal dashboard mm -hmm. uh, for our tracking and would understand how far to completion each and every other project is. We had clear information about how each variety was performing on each nursery bed. This was easy. This was made easy by the evaluation team. This is something we really want to take up yeah. uh, for our visualization uh, moving forward. So it was a key learning. And then also the element of uh, things like seed extraction, having flyers for households to, to always reference to, especially for some of the programs. This is something that the RTE has actually achieved and could be beneficial for our bigger right. program. So we have had some learnings. Yeah. Well, looking forward to see what new innovative projects you will come up with in the future. I'm sure we'll, we'll see more exciting stuff <laughs> coming our way. I'm, I'm representing the Ready to Eat team and yeah. uh, on behalf of the Ready to Eat team, I really want to appreciate 
uh, the team I've worked with since November last year mm -hmm. uh, in the different areas, in the different districts. We have really been um, so committed to work. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really want to appreciate their effort. This wouldn't have been a success without them committing their time, their effort, their knowledge, their skills to make this work. And uh, one continuing beneficiaries is not something to not to brag about, but here we are. Thanks to every other person. Yeah, it's it's a team effort as usual, for yeah. sure. And congratulations to everybody who was involved in the process for the last year who has contributed. Uh, thank you for taking the time to speak to me. Um, it's been extremely informing <laughs> um, and, and very fulfilling. Thank you, Timo. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you everyone for listening. If you want to find out more about the work we do, we encourage you to visit our website and follow us on all three of our social media channels. Our website and socials are linked in the description box below. Thanks again for listening and we hope you'll join us again next time.